Sound check was okay. It's actually different than usual because um, two nights ago we were in Newcastle and we'd done a sound check with Billy Doherty, our drummer. And then about half an hour before we were due on stage, Billy took ill, took really ill, and they had to call a paramedic and we weren't able to do the show. So that was frightening and all kinds of things. So we had a, the, the promoter. And Paul, the Flinner singer, and myself, we had to go out on stage and explain to them, you know, and we were like, what? So we have to reschedule that. But in the meantime, there's a drummer that we know, good friend of Damien's, and that bizarrely he's called Kevin Sharkey. No relation to Fergal, but he's from Derry and he lives in England, he lives up in the Lake District. So many years ago, Billy wasn't, wasn't able to do some shows, so we got Kevin in to do that. Years ago, at least 11 years ago, <laughs> but we rang him that night and said, Can you do Manchester, which was last night, and Liverpool, which is tonight? And he says, Yeah. So, but it meant that yesterday afternoon we had to go and rehearse with him and we had to run through the songs. And I'm like, No, no matter how good you are, if it's all new songs, you know, and we, we, we got through it. So that's the long answer to your short question here. Now it was the sound check. The sound check was us going through the songs that were a bit ragged last night. Now normally Undertones shows contain a fair number of ragged songs, you know, because the rest we can we can sort of lose concentration. So, so that's what that was. Kevin Sharkey, who's our our good friend, he is drumming tonight. So the sound check was more a rehearsal than the sound check. You've probably no more room for the rest of the TV now, have you? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> the Undertones have been around for, a 40, for over 45 years. Does the music still feel as fresh as it did since the first album? Uh, yes, it does. It does. Why does it do it? I think it's because they're short songs. And also because we don't do that many shows. You know, so we do kind of, we do enjoy it, enjoy playing. We rest. I was in there, like we've done two shows this weekend, and I was saying, I'm glad we're not doing more. <laughs> because, you know, you get a bit tired and you kind of, you know, none of us would be really people that would love to go on the road or anything. You know, it was, you just do some shows. So that kind of keeps it fresh. And also, you know, I, I don't know what it is. We, because we're not that slick, you know, it's not like we have a click track or we have any sequences or anything that really has to be the same show every night. You know, the songs vary in speed from night to night. So that kind of keeps it fresh. And we always, we always try and crack jokes and just have a bit of, you know, it's very light. You know I mean, there's no big speeches about the world or anything. It's us going on and playing loud punk rock. You know, loud and fast punk rock. Where did the name come from? It's <sighs> a good one. Um, Billy Doherty. Our drummer, who was recuperating in Derry, he found it in a history book. You know, like we were, we were still at school, kind of, and uh, well, he just left school, so there was a book lying in O'Neill's house where we used to hang around, and he kind of saw it just in some sentence. And we, at the time, bands were called, you know, one names or you know maybe two names. Bands weren't called the somethings. So we liked that, that it was sounded slightly old fashioned, the undertones. And we also liked it because at that stage we started listening to the Ramones, reading about the Ramones, so it rhymed with the Ramones. But it sounded like that kind of the somethings. So, you know, um, so that's, that's where it came from. And Fergal used to always say he never liked it. He never, never liked that name. Uh, and whatever we used to, whatever, we had a couple of friends or maybe guys that I knew school, whatever they discovered what the name was, you know, which is a terrible name, you know, 
the underpants, as the fella says it, my underpants. So, um, but I always liked it, you know, I, I, I liked it. And it's because it's still, it's, it's kind of a clumsy name almost as well, you know. I think, you know, it doesn't, it's not like The Clash or, you know, or The Ramones or anything like that, you know, or The Arctic Monkeys, it's The Undertones. You know? But yeah, I, I, I think we'll keep it. You started off, you did covers of Play in Schools. Did this give you an edge before releasing uh, original material? Uh, it's, we, it wasn't deliberate that we kind of decided we're not, we're going to do cover versions, we're not going to do, we're not going to write songs. Because back in those days, you know, fellas, we were like 16, 17, you weren't really, that you weren't really expected to write songs. John O'Neill used to write the odd song, but, it, you know, but he was doing that from, he was about that age, and he himself would say they weren't great. So for the first couple of years, from, you know, the first show we ever did was about March 1976. So for the first, certainly the first year, it was all cover versions, you know. But they were always kind of, they were, we always were, were picky about our cover versions, you know. You wouldn't just do, you know, like, well, we didn't do any Beatles cover versions, you know, we didn't do um, anything that was in the charts or anything like that, you know. We did, uh, well, we learned. Some songs from the Rolling Stones LP, Get Your Yai As It, Light LP from 69. We, whenever we got the Ramones LP, we learned some of that. We got an LP called Nuggets, which is like garage bands from the 60s. So we learned stuff like that. And through learning that and through playing it all the time, you got really good as a band. You know, like the five of us were, you know, we, we as, a, as the, for, I don't know if it's a musical phrase, but people say, you tighten up, you know? and. Uh, so we had that, and then you were you were influenced by by songs that you were covering by the Ramones, you know. We thought, and then that, that kind of led to us writing songs. So I think by playing uh, by doing cover versions, and at least this stage as well, no one was reviewing you or anything. You know, you were just playing a pub, really, a couple of pubs in Derry, and you know, maybe about half a dozen friends would come along and see, as well as the usual drinkers in the pub. So we 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 were lucky, and that we had a good run at that. And then by the time John started writing songs, and by the time Damien and myself started writing songs and Billy, we were good enough to, to make them sound good. You know, you know what I mean? We did good enough to, to ex execute them with a bit of phrase. You know? A good idea, well executed. That's what we were doing. You guys played in the, the US as part of the clash. Yeah. How, how did that feel as punk was new then? Well, first of all, it was great to be with the clash because um, it was just before London Calling was released, but they were playing songs from. So we heard that these songs, obviously we knew songs from the first LP, we knew their singles, we loved the class. You know. uh, and then we, we got the chance to hear these songs, like you know, Clampton and London Calling and stuff. They were doing these songs, but we hadn't heard them before. No one had heard them before. So we thought, this is really good. Also, we were in the, kind of mainly the East Coast. We were doing studies where punk would be, would have some kind of footprint, you know, especially in New York. New York had the punk. Whereas we play uh, Philadelphia, it was a good music scene there. Chicago, Toronto, we did that. Uh, so it was good, but you know, you're right, like punk hadn't taken off at all. And uh, a year later we went and we did some shows in the West Coast as well. And you just knew that, you know, you had a, you had some people knew it, but most by the street, there were still Peter Frampton fans and the Eagles and all, you know. Uh, but it was great being, being with The Clash in 1979. And you know the London Calling LP cover where Paul Simmons breaking the guitar? We supported them that night. Of course, I missed that photograph because it was New York. For my first time in New York, I thought, as soon as we were finished, I went out just to look around New York. But I came back and the rest of the band said, you missed it. Paul Simmons got the guitar and they smashed it. And then, of course, that ends up in the photograph you know, for, for London Calling. So yeah, it was an absolute privilege, so, absolute privilege. Do you still keep in touch with the remaining members of the Clash? No, no I don't. Um, even after, even on tour, we were not, we, we didn't really hang out with them much. We didn't drink, they did have a party whenever we were leaving, which was nice, you know. And they were always really friendly and so on, but you know, it's not like we went out and toured the, the nightclubs, you know. Um, no, no, I, I, I lived in London for a year in 1984 and I met Joe Strummer 
on the street, which I said on him, but like I was like Joe Strummer walking on the street with say only ten people at the least on a slow day. So he, it's not like he would be up for a big chat. Uh, I think I met Paul Summerlin once, but I didn't meet the, the others about that. In the 60 years from 83 to 99, what did you do? 83 to 99, I, well, first of all, after the rooms broke, broke up, Damien and myself thought we would try and start another band, and I moved to London, because up until then I'd always moved, lived in Derry, Damien lived in London, uh, and it was after a year you realised, ah, oh, this is no good. So, I, um, I, I got a job in London as a bicycle courier for a company based in Soho, uh, in Dean Street in Soho, and they were called Crossbar Couriers. And I did that, and it was brilliant. I did it for a year, and I got a, you know, you're, I, I got a mountain bike, which were kind of new at that stage, and you're really fit. I seen photographs of me, and I was like, like a stick. And you just had a great time just cycling. You know, we're, uh, you're, I had a walkie-talkie. <laughs> so, you know, he's a big toy. So you were all like, crossbar Mickey, crossbar Mickey, and I go, oh, yeah. And you know, they had to go back, pick up something, had to go to somewhere and pick up this package to deliver it somewhere else in London. I really had a ball. So that lasted a year. After that, I moved back to, to Derry. And after a year, I started doing radio programs <coughs> for the local BBC station. And then I got a job as a producer. And I stayed there until Christmas 2020. That's what I left the BBC. I guess I'll have a radio program. But uh, as a day job, you know, it was a full time job I had for 32 years as a producer. So, whenever we, we reformed, I kind of, well, it was okay because we didn't do that many shows. But then, whenever we were doing tours after that, I had to use up my holidays, my BBC holidays, to, to be able to go and, and do the shows. You know? But I never played in another band. After David and I, that thing just fell apart. Kind of, I had no interest in it at all. You know? I was still listening to, rec to records, of course. But, um, you know, I, I, I was always being asked to join a band, but I didn't really want to be in a band anymore. Um, and then we got back together again, and we practiced, and the crack was great. So, yeah, it's good. <laughs>